Hi guys, we're going to be talking about metabolism and nutrition in chapter 25. And in reality, we're only going to be able to get to metabolism. I had to cut out the nutrition part uh, because of the extended spring break situation. So I want to encourage you to take the nutrition class with Professor Doug Crowell because this is a great class. Overall, metabolism is just all the chemical reactions taking place in the cells. And you're going to be able to divide those up into two categories. Catabolic reactions are ones that break things down, and those are also considered exergonic. And that term exergonic means releasing energy. Anabolic reactions combine simple molecules to com make complex molecules, and those are going to be endergonic, meaning they require an input of energy to occur. Metabolism is going to result from the balance between catabolism and anabolism. And there's this energy molecule that I want you to remember, ATP or adenosine triphosphate. What you see in this figure is that there's a balance between the two reactions and how ATP helps to coordinate this. What you see first is that complex molecules are going to be broken down um, via catabolic reactions. And what that does is it transfers energy from those complex molecules to ATP and also releases heat in the process. And those complex molecules are now broken down into simple molecules such as glucose, amino acids, glycerol, and fatty acids. And those can be built back up into complex molecules. And in that process, they require energy and they get that energy from ATP and by breaking down ATP into ADP and what's called an inorganic phosphate. So you see this is a whole cycle. Complex molecules broken down via, via catabolism, simple molecules built up via anabolism. Those catabolic and anabolic reactions can be further classified as oxidative or reductive reactions. So oxidation reduction reactions are super important in energy transfer. So what I'm going to show you here is an oxidation reaction. Oxidation involves the removal of electrons from a atom. So as you can see here, lactic acid, two electrons plus two hydrogens are removed and you make pyruvate. Moving back the other way, you can reduce pyruvate or pyruvic acid into lactic acid by adding those two electrons back again. And that process is called reduction. Why do we call it reduction? It's because electrons are negative. So you're reducing by subtracting the charge of the electrons. So oxidation and reductions are exact opposites of each other. Why does this matter? Well, in metabolism, when substances are oxidized, they release electrons and hydrogens, and they're transferred to two coenzymes. So I want you to remember the names of these two coenzymes, NAD, and you don't have to remember the scientific name, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide. But what you see here is that when those electrons and hydrogens are released, in living systems, they are going to be added on to NAD or FAD. Let's go back and look at that initial reaction that we saw when lactic acid is oxidized to produce pyruvic acid. What you see is that lactic acid loses electrons and hydrogens and those are donated to NAD. And what we always see is that oxidation and reduction reactions occur together so that when one substance is oxidized, the other is reduced. So before we saw that lactic acid was oxidized to pyruvate, so something else has to be reduced. What we see is that NAD is reduced to NADH. So how do these oxidation reduction reactions relate to ATP that I talked about earlier? Actually, some of the energy released during an oxidation reaction is captured when ATP is formed. And so what you see here is that adenosine diphosphate, which has two phosphate groups, a third phosphate group is added to create ATP. So oxidation re reduction reactions can help with making ATP from ADP. The reason I talk about ATP and oxidation reductions reactions is so that you understand carbohydrate metabolism. Carbohydrate metabolism is actually mostly glucose metabolism. The process of cellular re respiration is 
catabolism of glucose, meaning breaking down a larger molecule into smaller molecules in order to form ATP. And there are four sets of reactions that are involved. Glycolysis, formation of acetyl coenzyme A, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Let's look at cellular respiration in more detail. What you see here in glycolysis is that glucose is converted into pyruvic acid. And then you see these molecules on the side, ATP that we talked about earlier, and NADH. And I want you to recall that NAD is reduced to make NADH, and FAD is reduced to make FADH2. And we're gonna call these electron carriers. So you see that you make ATP, which is an energy molecule, and electron carriers during glycolysis. And then the next step is formation of acetyl coenzyme A. And again, you're going to make more of these high energy carriers, NAD, and you're also gonna release carbon dioxide in the process. And then you go through the Krebs cycle and you make more high energy carriers, NAD and FADH2. You release more carbon dioxide and you also produce ATP. And then what ends up happening is all those high energy or electron carriers are going to donate their electrons to the electron transport chain. And in that process, they make a bunch more ATP. So in addition to all the ATP we made before, we also make 26 or 28 molecules of ATP. And then we use oxygen to make water. So what you can see, and this is why we call it cellular respiration, what you see is that you're using up oxygen, producing carbon dioxide, which clearly makes sense since it's a respiration process. And in the process, we're using up glycogen, or I'm sorry, we're using up glucose and producing a bunch of high energy molecules called ATP. Going more in depth now into each of the components of cellular respiration, glycolysis actually has 10 reactions. And what it does is it converts one six carbon glucose molecule into two three carbon molecules of pyruvic acid. And I'm not asking you to memorize all the reactions in glycolysis. You can take cell and molecular biology with me if you wanna learn those. But what I am asking you to learn is that glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid via this process called glycolysis. The next step that we talk about, I'm actually calling the fate of pyruvic acid because there's two different destinations for pyruvic acid depending on conditions. Typically under aerobic conditions, meaning there's plentiful oxygen available, pyruvic acid is going to be converted into acetyl coenzyme A. However, under low oxygen conditions, or this would be considered anaerobic, pyruvic acid is converted into lactic acid which is why exercising muscles have lactic acid buildup because we use our oxygen really quickly. And then after that, they're gonna be converted into lactic acid instead of going through the rest of the cycles of cellular respiration. From there, acetyl coenzyme A is going to enter what's called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. And this cycle occurs in the mitochondria and it's a series of eight reactions that happens over and over and over again. And like we saw earlier, it's gonna produce ATP, but it's also going to reduce NAD and FAD. And those are gonna be my electron carriers that help me in the next stage of the reactions. The final stage in cellular respiration is the electron transport chain. And what happens is NADH and FADH2 donate their electrons to a series of electron carriers in the mitochondria. And that mitochondria causes a pumping of hydrogen ions across the mitochondrial membrane, which ultimately comes back and drives this other molecule just above my head called ATP synthase. ATP synthase is super efficient and it causes the um, phosphorylation of ADP so that you make 26 to 28 ATP molecules through this process. So overall, 
throughout the entire process of cellular respiration, you make somewhere between 30 to 32 ATP molecules. Because you have a bunch of ATP molecules maybe before you get into the electron transport chain, and then you have all those 26 to 28 made in the electron transport chain. So altogether, you have a lot of ATP molecules. The reaction for cellular respiration is the one listed above. Glucose plus oxygen plus 30 or 32 ADPs, adenosine diphosphate, plus 30 or 32 lone phosphates, produce carbon dioxide, water, and somewhere around 30 to 32 ATP molecules. That's a lot of ATP. And what do we use ATP for? Well, we talked about it earlier. We use ATP to help drive anabolic reactions. So we break down molecules or we break down glucose via catabolic reactions, and then we use the ATP we make to drive anabolic reactions, reactions that build up or make larger molecules. There are a couple other processes that occur in carbohydrate metabolism besides cellular respiration. One of those is glycogenesis. So when glucose isn't being used to make ATP, it can be stored and usually it's stored in the liver as glycogen. You also have glycogenolysis. So stored glycogen can be converted back to glucose and then broken down via cellular respiration to make ATP. So the process of glycogenolysis is just breaking down glycogen into a smaller molecule that can go through cellular respiration. Glucose is the key fuel source for the body. But what happens when we don't have glucose and we can't break down glycogen? What else can you do? Your body can go through this process called gluconeogenesis. And it actually can make glucose from non-glucose precursors, such as portions of fats, triglycerides, lactic acid, and certain amino acids. And this is promoted by cortisol, glucagon, and thyroid hormones that together work to make more gluconeogenesis occur in the body. There are four processes that involve glucose that I want you to know that sound very similar. So let's discuss each one. Glycolysis is breaking down glucose into pyruvate. Glycogenesis is actually going to be glucose storage in the form of glycogen. Glycogenolysis is going to be breaking down glycogen to make glucose. And then gluconeogenesis is actually the formation of glucose from proteins and fats. After carbohydrate metabolism, let's talk about lipid metabolism. Lipids are hydrophobic, so they're going to not be able to dissolve in water. Instead, they need to circulate bound to proteins in these complexes called lipoproteins. There are four classes of lipoproteins that I want you to know. Chylomicrons are going to transport lipids that you consume to your adipose tissue. VLDLs are going to transport uh, lipids that are made in the liver to your fat cells. LDL and HDL are two categories that I want you to be able to differentiate. LDL uh, carries 75% of the total cholesterol in the blood and they deliver it to cells, whereas HDL remove that excess cholesterol and transport it to the liver for elimination. So when you go to the doctor's office and you get your cholesterol me levels measured, you're gonna wanna have higher levels of HDL and lower levels of LDL. So LDL would be considered the lethal or the not healthy cholesterol, and HDL is considered the healthy cholesterol. Why do we care about cholesterol? Well, you can consume cholesterol, but in reality, most of the cholesterol in your body is made by your liver cells. And high levels of total cholesterol are associated with a greater risk of coronary artery disease or heart disease. However, things like exercise and diet and certain drugs can reduce these high cholesterol levels. What's interesting is that lipids or fats can be used to produce ATP in a manner similar to how glucose makes ATP. If your body has excess lipids, they're going to be stored as adipose tissue. However, you can also make lipids when you don't have enough. The majority of your body's energy reserves is stored as VLDL, 
or very low density lipoproteins in your adipose tissue. The other 2% is stored as glycogen in your liver. So when your body uses up all the glycogen available to it, it'll start expending the energy from your fat reserves. So lipid catabolism, recall that catabolism is the breakdown of a fuel source, is called lipolysis, and it's going to split triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol. Lipid anabolism, or the process of making more lipids, is also called lipogenesis, and it can take glucose or amino acids and turn them into fats. And this occurs when people consume more calories than they need. What I want you to see here is the interconnectedness of glycolysis. You see where glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid, converted to acetyl-CoA, and ultimately goes into the Krebs cycle, and lipid and fat metabolism. So what you see is that when we have excess glucose, it can be converted to fat. When we have excess fat, it can be converted to glucose. So just eating a low fat diet will not make you not store fats because if you eat a low fat diet with high carbohydrates, you're just gonna convert it to fat anyway and vice versa. Now proteins are our final fuel source and proteins can be broken down into amino acids or they can be oxidized to make ATP. Proteins aren't stored. Proteins are actually going to be what serves the majority of functions in our body, such as enzymes, antibodies, muscle fibers, and that sort of thing. But we don't have a way of just storing protein for later use. Protein catabolism or breaking down proteins is gonna yield amino acids or it's gonna cause conversion of amino acids into fatty acids or ketone bodies or glucose. Sometimes cells oxidize amino acids to make ATP and they do this via the Krebs cycle that we talked about earlier. Protein anabolism is basically creating more proteins. And this is taking those individual amino acids, which are the individual components, and linking them together to make these large proteins. And this occurs in ribosomes. You recall the Krebs cycle? We talked about it a couple of times before. And the Krebs cycle, again, creates those electron carriers that donate to the electron transport chain. But as you can see here, there's a bunch of different amino acids that also can work through the Krebs cycle to ultimately produce more ATP. In reality, you have 20 amino acids that your body needs, and nine of those are considered essential. So what that means is of the 20 that your body needs, nine you have to consume in food. You can't make them. The other 11 you can make, and you can make them from other fuel sources such as fat or carbohydrates. So that is the end of the content that we're gonna be covering for chapter 25. Be sure to review chapter 25's handout and the reading guide and objectives and read the content in the book. Also review all the other course material on Converge when you study, including the crash course anatomy because those are very helpful for understanding all this content.